record this session and post it onto our website thereafter. Uh, the other technical items that I want to go through quickly with you today, uh, I get the, the fun task of doing the administrivia this afternoon. And then you'll get to hear from uh, the boss lady, Dr. Erica Oriens, who's going to share some framing remarks and turn it over to Dr. Kim Hearns from Washtenaw Community College, who will also be sharing some framing remarks. And then she'll be introducing our panel. We have a fantastic panel this afternoon for you. And we had a planning session last week that was just as good as I expect today to be. It was a fabulous conversation and I came away from it uh, with growth in these areas. And then if you know me, you know I'm gonna ask you to go to Twitter uh, because we're hoping to have this conversation keep going on our Twitter back channel. And I'm also going to make a semi-desperate plea because we are asking you to engage with us in multiple venues this afternoon and throughout the Student Success Summit activities. The first way we'll do that is by asking you to click the little button next to your name to rename yourself and add the name of your college or institution. You won't have the opportunity to speak today. Some of you were involved last week in an incident where our Zoom session got hacked. And so we have taken some precautions to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Unfortunately, one of those precautions is that our, our participants are not able to unmute yourselves. So you won't be able to verbally engage with us today, but we ask you to talk with us on the Zoom group chat and also through Twitter. We are very close to 500 followers on Twitter. And Jenny and I, when we set out this new Twitter campaign idea, we made a goal of 500 followers. So any of you that are not on Twitter yet and would like to humor us, who are tired after two weeks of virtual sessions, please go make yourself a profile and follow us, even just for that purpose. You don't wanna follow along with the rest of the activities. However, I will say that we've had some very rich conversation on Twitter and I expect that will continue in today's session as well. And I appreciate my colleagues putting some links into the chat box as well. Thanks so much. Um, so with that, I also want to let you know that your video is optional this afternoon. Those of us who are speaking will probably stay on video, but some of my colleagues have busy households, uh, myself included. So you may get to see my um, children or my animals in the background. My dog usually, if you're looking at my video, sleeps right there when I'm talking because I'm so boring to him. Um, but the, for the rest of you, we know that, if, especially if you're working at home, there could be things going on that prohibit your use of video and that's a-okay. You are welcome to join us however you're comfortable this afternoon. And with that, um, I will remind you that today's slides are on the web. And then I will also let you know that there's a host of other cool stuff um, from the other sessions that have happened throughout the last two weeks on the web as well. And that is all the administrivia that I have to cover. I will ask Dr. Oriens to share some information about our interest in equity and the way that we are framing our work more squarely on this idea of equity moving forward. Thanks, Katie. And uh, can you hear me okay? Great. And uh, welcome, everyone. I'll share my welcome as well uh, to the fifth day of the Student Success Summit, um, which has been really great to connect with all of you over the last few days. To start our session off today, I wanted to revisit um, some of the work that we've been doing at the Center, of Student Su Center for Student Success that we um, provided a pretty detailed overview of in the first session that we had last Wednesday. And I'll start by sharing with you um, that this summer, um, you know, in response to the police violence and, um, you know, racism that we saw this summer, um, in addition to, you know, a lot of the inequalities that we see in our country and also in higher education, uh, the MCCA uh, and along with our presidents released our statement that fo focused on racial equity. And um, in that work, I think uh, we've been thinking about this at the Center for Student Success as well in thinking about um, how we uh, engage in equity in our work as well. So this has been a conversation that we've been having among our staff. But in the MCCA statement, we knew it wasn't enough just to, um, you know, make a statement about um, racism and police violence. We wanted to do something about it, and we wanted to think about what that really meant to us. Um, Katie, next slide. And so uh, the MCCA uh, identified six commitments, very specific things that we as an association and, and as a collection of community colleges wanted to focus on. 
Of course, when you start making a list, undoubtedly you leave things out. Um, but we felt like this was an important list of things that we wanted to commit to. Next slide. At the center, we really want to focus on four of these issues. And I think uh, these commitments that we've made um, to eliminate barriers to access in higher education, um, to disaggregate data, uh, to think about completion of college level English and math courses and how important that is for uh, students, and then to create more opportunities for students to earn associate degrees and bachelor's degrees. And I as I reflect on these commitments, I think about this session in the topic of equity and mobility. And I, uh, having looked through some of the questions I know we'll talk about, um, we're hitting on a lot of these commitments that are really important to the association. Um, you'll also notice that they align nicely with a lot of the work that we've been doing at the Student Success Center. And I think part of that is because we, in our reflections, feel like equity um, and has been a part of an implicit part of the work that we've done. But at the center, we also wanted to make that a more explicit part of the work that we've done. So Katie, if you go on to the next slide, um, we released our new vision um, for 2020. And um, with that comes a nice graphic image that goes along with that. Um, and in the blue boxes, we identified um, our, val our core values. And then in the green boxes, we identified our strategies for how we do that work. So Katie, if you want to go on to the next slide, um, you'll see that uh, our vision since we were created in 2011 remains very, well, quite the same as it was back then. But one thing that we thought was really critical is that we um, added the term uh, our, in our ongoing efforts to improve equitable student outcomes. Um, in looking at the data that we have available, uh, it's not enough to improve student outcomes. We need to take a much closer look at equity as well. Katie, next slide. Sorry, I have to apologize. These are dropped in from another deck and they're on a timer. So, um, oh, we'll okay, do our best. thanks. <laughs> thanks. Um, so, I'll just focus really quickly on um, the values that really determine the work that we do. And um, the, those four values that, that we identified there evidence, coherence, innovation, and equity. Um, equity being at the center of that in this graphic is really deliberate on our part. Um, we wanted to make sure that this is core to what we're doing and core to what, um, when we think about the work that we're doing, that we want to make sure that that's really part of that. Um, and uh, we, we want to focus on eliminating, eliminating barriers, um, it, addressing persistent inequalities, and um, thinking about not only um, inequitable outcomes when we look at data, but also our campus culture as well. Um, are we welcoming organizations um, for historically marginalized students? So I just wanted to provide a little bit of a context at the beginning of our session here around um, how we're thinking about the work that we do at the center, um, and how that kind of relates to the session that we're having today. Uh, with that, I also would like to introduce our fantastic session moderator. I feel very lucky because this is the second meeting I've had with Dr. Kimberly Hearns, who's the Vice President of Instruction at Washtenaw Community College. Uh, Kimberly, uh, prior to her role as the Vice President of Instruction, served as the Dean for Business and Computer Technologies and, and the Entrepreneurship Center Administrator. And she's been a business instructor at Washtenaw Community College since 2002. Uh, she's also on the board at the Nonprofit Enterprise at Work, NEW, and she currently serves as the chair of the Michigan ACE Women's Network. Uh, uh, and in 2019, she was named one of Crane's Notable Women in Education Leadership. And in addition to all of those wonderful things about Kimberly, she is also a fantastic person. <laughs> 
So I am grateful that I got the opportunity to introduce her today and I will turn it over to you, Kimberly. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, before we get started and I introduce our wonderful, wonderful panel, I just want to give a little bit of context of the work. Um, and just, and I think some of this work is consistent across the state, but that's the work that we're doing at Washington and how it relates to this conversation. Um, there are some things that are unique about Washington Community College that we actually sit in between two higher ed institutions. I mean, literally, we sit in between them. Um, one being University of Michigan, and the other being is Eastern Michigan University. Um, and I think also those two institutions almost stand as a metaphor to the work that we're charged to do in Washtenaw County, um, in that we live in a county or in a city where, you know, we have the highest population of educated people in Ann Arbor. Um, but on the other side of the county, um, we have um, different disparities um, in those zip codes. And one of the things that I think is extremely unique is that as much as Ann Arbor grows in some very unique um, ways, becoming a tech leader, um, Ypsilanti, the gaps in those zip codes continue to grow and persist. So as fast as Ann Arbor is growing, Ypsilanti and those gaps in those zip codes actually grow as well. Um, and so when we look at the equity gaps, you know, in that area, I often tell people that there's only one institution in Washtenaw County that is charged with serving equity, um, and that is Washtenaw Community College. Um, as a community college, it is part of our mission and here in our mission is equity. But I think as Erica noted, we've done that work, but we've not been explicit about that work. So in the last several years, uh, we've really been looking at student success and starting with looking at disaggregated data at the college and we've made some really big strides. But one of the things that we've seen is that persistent in our equity gaps at the college are also persistent equity gaps when it comes to transfer. Um, and so I view transfer for us as a college as not only a challenge, but also as an opportunity. So when we think about the work that the governor has charged us to do um, across the state in increasing um, completion and goal attainment for our citizens, we wanna also make sure as, as was noted with MCCA that those are equitable changes. So when we see those shifts um, in the number of people who actually have attained um, post-secondary degrees, we wanna make sure that they're equitable. And so that's the kind of work that we've been doing at Washington Community College. Like I said, we have a unique challenge with those two institutions. Um, so transfer has definitely become a key part of our student success push, but equitable transfer and knowing that we want to see um, more students, more, um, more students transfer. Um, just to make sure that we have that data, something we're all proud of in the mind for our mission. Kim, I hate to interrupt you, Kim. I, I hate to interrupt you. Your sound is going in and out. And I don't know if you have a solution for that. Uh, sometimes I find if I shut my video down, the audio works better, but I'm open to other suggestions. I shut my video down and I'm, are we getting a little bit better? It sort of comes in and out. It's just, you'll have moments where you're quite smooth and then it's a little bit garbled. I don't know if the video trick helped at all, actually. <laughs> I don't know if it helped at all. Okay, I am going to, so, so I won't mess up our time flow, Katie. What I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out how to do the dial-in. It's a, somebody said it's a little bit better? No? It sounds better I can now, do a yeah. dial -in. Why don't, okay. I think, let's keep going. Our friends are telling us it's better. So okay. we'll go with their okay. expertise. And if you okay. end up having to drop right. off at any point, I am I am ready to fill in for you. Okay, real good. So we're going to tag team if we need to. All right. So I am going to introduce our wonderful panel. Um, and the and the comment that I was going to say in doing that was it's awesome to have a conversation about equity that is at least um, combined with some solutions um, as we look at transfer um, as an opportunity for us um, to see better equitable outcomes. All right, our first panelist is Dr. Julie Ajinka. She is the Vice President of Applied Research at the Institute for Higher Education Policy with a special focus on equity in higher education. She is also a visiting professor of government at Cornell University's campus in Washington, DC. And she sits on the advisory council for Amherst College's Loeb Center for Career Exploration and Planning. 
In 2019, Diverse Issues in Higher Education named Dr. Ajinkya one of the top 35 women in higher education. All right, and Mr. John Fink, our second panelist, he is a Senior Research Associate at the Community College Research Center at Teachers College Columbia University. His research examines student transitions, focusing specifically on structural barriers to educational and economic opportunity for racially minoritized, low-income, and first-generation students. He has been published in several higher education journals and was recognized in 2019 with the Transfer Catalyst Award by the National Institute for the Study of Transfer of Students. Dr. Leah Wettstein was recently appointed as the Acting Director of Community College Research Initiatives at the University of Washington. She was previously employed with CCRI as an Associate Research Director and Research Scientist. Her research centers on equity, student success reforms, transfer, and educational experiences in environmental and STEM education. Prior to her education research work, she worked in the national sciences in higher education in multiple roles, including teaching, curriculum design, K-12, and community outreach. And finally, Dr. Dr. Ebony Zamani Galur is a professor of higher education and community college leadership as well as the Director of the Office for Community College Research and Leadership at the University of Illinois. She also serves as the Executive Director of the Council for the Study of Community Colleges. And she has been published numerous times and earned multiple awards in her career, most recently being recognized in 2019 by both the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators as the recipient of the Community College Research Award by the National Institute for the study of transfer students. Also the Transfer Callus Award, which is in good company with our other panelist, John Fink. So we're gonna get started with our questions. Um, as Katie had mentioned, we had a really good robust conversation last week talking about uh, these topics. And it was, it, was, it was very, very inspiring. And one of the things that came up was the importance for us to at least undergird our conversation today with some key definitions. Um, so, Ebony, I'm going to ask you and start off here with um, something that you brought up in that conversation is how are the terms like equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, how are they used interchangeably, but how are they also understood as the same things across the board? And then how do we succinctly name the real equity issues we need to address if we will make structural change for our historically marginalized students? for whom higher education has been inaccessible and unwelcoming. What's a mouthful? <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having all of us. Uh, and, you know, just to get going, I guess, with regard to your question, the way I would approach it, approach it is uh, to talk about um, the lack thereof of, of level setting. Uh, in many contexts, you know, albeit community colleges or K-12, uh, partners uh, in industry, uh, university settings and the like, uh, there's a way in which um, the terms you, you just shared, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, you know, it's like this gumbo whereby they're thought to be euphemisms from one another when in fact they're not synonymous that uh, they may bear some overlap, but they are mutually exclusive. And so um, there's a necessity, I think, um, as institutions think about how they want to move the needle, right, to one, get beyond just um, the rhetoric, um, but also come up with some more um, commonality and some universality around what they mean when they even say equity. You know, who does it include? Um, who does it not include? Who does it advance? Um, and I think oftentimes when we think about equity, um, it gets conflated also with equality, right? So you talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, there's some wonderful work by Dr. D.L. Stewart at uh, Colorado State, where D.L. Um, kind of problematizes and, and situates um, a conversation, if you will, that diversity and equity, inclusion and justice have with one another. Um, and so I think when we think about equity, um, and particularly thinking about some of the work of Dr. Estella Ben-Simone, um, you know, equity-mindedness is really this kind of perspective of mode of thinking 
um, from practitioners where they're, they're looking to call attention to what are um, gaps, right? So patterns of inequity and student outcomes. So lots of conversation that we hear about folks saying, you know, disaggregate the data, but it's about getting um, beyond, beneath and under the numbers um, to do more of a root cause analysis. And so at OCCRL, um, we are unapologetically and have been very explicitly about centering equity. Um, and when talking about equity, actually also um, facing race, um, you know, because a lot of times uh, what I get back is I'm committed to diversity. Uh, our institution wants to ensure equity, um, yet no one can face race or name race. Yet when we talk about the equity gaps or achievement gaps, um, you know, the onus is put upon the students. So we really push folks to, to not just be equity minded in terms of thinking about that disaggregation of data um, to identify um, what we see as opportunity gaps, um, but to be equity conscious, right? And so that equity consciousness is about the extent to which we match up our rhetoric and right size the realities where there is the the action step if you will beyond the statements and we've seen many of them come out in the last couple months um with being a, a equity oriented change agent all right thank you ebony and i think one of the things that comes to my mind is that you know a lot of us in community colleges and i, and I can speak for myself as from a faculty standpoint when i was full-time faculty i always felt very confident that we were doing equity work we worked at a community college and we were doing equity work. And so, you know, as I became an administrator and I really started to dig into the data, you know, it is shocking to some of us to even see that the results do not hold true um, in what we think we're doing and what's actually happening. So I think it's important for us to be brave around um, facing race and looking at the information in that, in, in that way. So one and coming up with that common language, right? Because absolutely. so many people have differing opinions of, of what it is and what it's not. Right, right. And one thing that's nice is we work in higher ed. So opinions and facts are different. And we have to make sure that we stay on what the definitions are and, and, and face those facts, I think is important. So I think that's a, a really good point to ground this conversation. And then John, we want to define mobility. So when we look at the ever-changing higher ed landscape, how does equity underscore the idea of mobility? Hey, thank you, and um, hey, everyone. It's, uh, good, it's, uh, it's great to be with you all this afternoon. So I'm going to sort of do some level setting around this idea of mobility. Um, I'll sort of start with transfer, but I think it is, when you think about something like mobility, there's it, it a broader frame. But um, surely for students' transition, sort of the coming and going of students enrolling in different types of institutions, there's just a lot of mobility happening in higher ed um, from two to four year and everything in between the transfer swirl. Um, it's really a complex network, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, of course, there's the community college transfer route to the bachelor's degree. This is, has a significant importance for um, upward social mobility and um, increasing representativeness of who has bachelor's degrees in our country. Um, but it's also just, it thought it'd be important to note that a lot of students start at four-year institutions and transfer as well, including um, almost the, uh, so about 40% of four-year entrance transfer institutions and 60% of those transfers from four years um, are, go to community colleges. There's a lot of just transfer in a lot of direction. Um, a lot of that is su that summer swirling. Um, but when you see something like, you know, community uh, among bachelor's degree graduates, um, about half of them nationally have some community college award. I think that's just very striking. And there, there's a huge role that community colleges have been playing in terms of preparing students for the bachelor's although they don't always get the credit for that, um, as many students transfer before completing a community college award. But there's also just a huge room for improvement and a need for improvement, especially um, in how community colleges are partnering with universities to serve students of color, low-income students, and, other, and students from other marginalized groups. Um, so that's sort of uh, a part of our research with the National Student Clearinghouse has been sort of painting that picture around the, the you know, that few, uh, that we have all these students entering community college, um, a majority of whom aspire to transfer and earn a bachelor's. But if we look six years out, only about a third of students ever enroll at a university. Um, uh, of the students who transfer, only about a third transfer with a community college award. Um, and then after that six year period, about only about 
one in five or fewer than one in five students complete a bachelor's degree. And uh, not only is that sort of a low rate overall, but we see these persistent gaps by race and income on, on all of those outcomes, um, including you know, what researchers have called the racial transfer gap. Um, that, you know, has, 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 you know, I think almost 10 years ago, folks have been starting to talk about this. Um, and, you know, I think a, a theme of our prior conversation, I hope that we can talk to today is like, sort of, you know, looking, disaggregating the data versus sort of moving to insight and then action actually from that and getting, um, uh, as Ebony said, to the root causes of what's going on and how um, that's actually the hard part, you know, we can lay out the data uh, as a first step, but um, moving to action is is where the real challenge is. Um, but just some more on, on transfer, um, you know, transfer credit loss um, is a big factor. There's a lot of work happening, I know, in Michigan and other states to work on that. Um, and, you know, I, I used to be a transfer advisor at the University of Maryland, and I, I worked with community college students that transferred. Um, and they were like, they were just like amazing students, you know, and now I think with this, uh, you know, I, with this perspective of, of seeing that, that leaky pipeline, um, you know, it, I oftentimes think back to working with students and, um, you know, along their pathway to completing a bachelor's and their issues with transfer credit loss. Um, and, you know, we, we did this study in, where we looked at successful community college transfer students that completed a bachelor's degree. Even among those completers, there's additional penalties in terms of extra time to degree and extra credits to completion. Um, that is sort of like this transfer penalty, but that is sort of an inequitable penalty as well. Uh, you know, for for white students, uh, we found that, that successful transfers or er, er, attempted about a quarter more credits, so between like 30, 20 and thirty excess credits. Um, for black students, it was about a third more. So you just think about like the layers of inequity um, within student mobility. Um, it's just at really at all levels. And, you know, one of the um, frameworks that's been uh, surfacing to address um, these low and inequitable transfer outcome is this idea of transfer student momentum. And essentially, how can colleges work to cultivate more momentum um, and uh, and to more equitably, you know, serve the students seeking bachelor's degrees? And I, this is on my desk. I wanted to give a plug um, to this. I don't have slides, but this is my very low tech slide that I'm showing. Um, this is a, a book that came out earlier this year. Uh, uh, Julie Wong, a professor at the University of Wisconsin, that uh, really gave a comprehensive picture of the route to STEM transfer, but all the lessons I think apply uh, more broadly, um, you know, tracking students and doing, speaking with students in interviews and focus groups, as well as looking at their longitudinal administrative records. Um, and in, in the book, also shout out to uh, Dr. Zamani Gelher uh, with the quote on the back cover, but in the book, okay, so this is this is getting really nerdy. I apologize. So in fi uh, maybe this is all backwards, but figure eight point one is a favorite. Um, maybe you can't see it. Anyway, big plug to this book. But I think what's really important about um, uh, Dr. Wong's work is that she takes an asset frame to thinking about students. So it's not how do we help students gain momentum. It's like students have the momentum. How do we? How do institutions not? like create friction. How do we, she calls them counter, mo, counter momentum friction forces, mm -hmm. um, you know, and in particularly, she, you know, she talks about the layers of friction. First of which is half, is the classroom experience, a classroom and advising uh, environments that students are encountering, the agents of the institution, and how that um, non-inclusive uh, environments in the classroom or through advising disproportionately impact students of color and those from other marginalized groups. Um, and also, these students are encountering structural forces like structural racism, as well as sort of structural uh, lack of funding of community colleges and the confusing sort of pathways to transfer. Uh, but I think what this raises is just um, if we want to close gaps, we need to elevate solutions that have disproportionate impact in a positive way uh, for students of color, um, for, this, for the, the populations that we want to elevate um, as institutions. Um, and what the other sort of research that's forthcoming that we're doing in, um, in another state is um, is sort of show, I think what's really exciting here is that we're, we're finding disproportionately positive effects for students of color. And that is, we're essentially looking at 
um, students' trajectory to the to transfer in a bachelor's degree, and finding that um, students who um, who do uh, hit these milestones, you know, early credit momentum, um, passing sort of key gateway courses, and entering and completing transfer degrees. Um, for those sort of milestones benefit all students, but um, especially have stronger uh, effects in increasing the likelihood of transfer for black and Latinx and low income students. Um, and so I think that, you know, a sort of uh, broader theme coming out from that research is just the importance of if we want to close these gaps in the long term outcomes, um, they're emerging right away. And we need to sort of, uh, it's sort of a, a question of when, when to intervene. And, um, it, you know, our, our sort of, our, our findings are suggesting as soon as possible. Uh, we see a lot of the attrition uh, happening in the first term and in the first year. Um, so I think I'll, I'll sort of um, stop there. That's okay. John, I think John made some really good points that actually outline things like racial, racial transfer gaps, credit loss, you know, the kind of things that we should be looking for. Um, but he also talked about, I think, some really good solutions some things that are happening that are working. So one of the things that we also talked about when it relates to data um, and, and, and these issues was, um, we talked about organizations claiming to be data driven, but to what extent are they data informed? And furthermore, we're having an equity lens but are we truly acting as equity change agents? Are we doing the work? Some of the things that John mentioned. Um, so Julie, could you talk to us a little bit about what you see as critical elements of the data story to holistically consider equity in higher education today? And what are the real opportunities that pr practitioners have to use data as an authentic starting point to address the mobility challenges of today's students? Absolutely. Thank you, Kim. And thanks to everyone um, for a great conversation so far, great comments. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of today's session. So, you know, at IHEP, we really believe, like Kim said, you know, in the importance of data as a critical starting point to conversations that are informed um, and evidence-based. But we do think that good data can only promote student success and close equity gaps if you use it. Because data in and of itself isn't the end that we are seeking, but in fact, it's an incredibly powerful tool. So then what does that mean um, to actually using data, right? How do we use it to make sure that we are becoming the equity change agents that Kim was asking about? Um, so, you know, where are we right now? We see a lot of discussions applying that equity lens, meaning disaggregating data. Um, now, I can't believe in 2020 that we still have to make recommendations that folks should disaggregate based on race and ethnicity. I mean, to me, that's unconscionable. So I think if you're not disaggregating your data, you're doing something wrong, um, just flat you know, outright. But once you disaggregate that data, you start to see patterns, you start to ask some uncomfortable questions about why the data looks that way, right? So, um, and I'll name some resources and uh, someone more Twitter proficient than me will actually post these up there. But I have recently um, released a report that looked at the importance of disaggregating data even within racial and ethnic categories, right? So this was a brief that was co-authored with um, the Southeast Asian um, South Resource Action Center, CRAC, talking about the importance of disaggregating data so that certain student groups within the big and broad AAPI community aren't rendered invisible. And, you know, so that's one example, but that's really why we want to disaggregate data, right? Because as other panelists were saying, if you can't identify the problems, how are you supposed to work on them? So what does working on them actually look like? Um, I really think that one of the best examples I've ever come across um, was an institution in Philadelphia um, where we actually interviewed um, the vice provost there who had come from a background in looking at, through the criminal justice system, looking at predictive analytics 
to think about how powerful data can be in actually predicting behavior. Now, once he entered the administration of the institution, he thought that type of data analysis could be really helpful in telling the administration something more about the students who were most likely to hit some barriers and challenges along their way to completion. So he, he basically made a case for using predictive modeling to identify students um, that the institution needed to target resources towards to help them along the path to completion. But here's the important part. The second piece of that strategy was then investing in the advising core of the institution, right? So that those advisors then had this very powerful data saying, you know, after this semester, this student population is disproportionately dropping off. You know, so it gave them that important data. But they also had to figure out, you know, the reasons why. And that's, I think, what helps us shift from data being, you know, an end and of itself to a tool to reveal what's going on. If you continue to ask equity conscious questions, like Ebony was saying, you know, asking why certain students are facing those barriers, then you start to really interrogate the other systems in society that higher ed is interacting with every day, right? Because students don't experience higher ed in a vacuum. They experience it in the context of our housing system. They experience it in the context of our infrastructure system that determines which public transportation lines stay alive and which get cut out. They experience it in the context of a healthcare system that is under incredible strain, you know, pre-pandemic. So, you know, the criminal justice system, for instance, they're in interacting with it in their communities, in their families just by living in this nation with our incredible incarceration rate. And so when you start to interrogate what students are experiencing outside of higher ed, I think that's when we start to really identify what the solutions can be to actually help them overcome barriers that impact them in our space, in higher education. But that's to me the real way that we can start um, attacking these structural um, problems and these structural arrangements because systems can be designed to exclude. They have been designed to exclude. So in my opinion, if you can actually use the system, rearrange it, that's when you actually get at the heart of that, um, that inequity, that unfairness that we're seeing a lot of students experience. Um, and, you know, just to really bring this home, I think one of the best examples of using data to do on your campus um, is actually an initiative that many, many institutions I see um, represented on this call in Michigan are part of. And it's IHEP's Degrees When Do National Initiative, which really promotes creating a culture of data use on your campus, bringing together different departments the registrar, institutional researchers, advisors, bringing all of these folks who have a vested interest in student success together to look at their data and figure out which students have actually earned enough credits to receive a degree, but for whatever reason, institutional policies many times, they stop out without that degree. And in the process of mining that data and auditing degree maps, these institutions are also finding near completers, right? So thousands of students who have actually acquired quite a significant amount of credits and are just short of the completion line. And Oakland Community College in Michigan um, was able to go even further and use this transformed sort of culture that appreciates the power of data Apologize, you're gonna hear some DC sirens in a second. <laughs> um, you know, and they actually identified the need and created a new technical associates degree by engaging with their campus data. So they saw that the degree met the needs of students who had accumulated a variety of technical course credits across an array of technical fields. And it actually together generated, um, you know, a complete technical associates degree 
And so this is just a fantastic example of the power of data if you don't stop there, if you don't stop with the output that show us racial and ethnic equity gaps, but you actually ask question after question to figure out why those gaps exist, and then actually use the data to create solutions like this new degree. You know, Oakland made it possible for 769 students to cross the finish line um, with this degree. And so you know, this is making a real impact in students' lives and just gives us an example of how powerful data can be. So I think I'll stop there, but I'm happy to answer questions about the initiative as we continue to talk. All right. Well, thanks, Julian. I, I note that someone put in the chat information about degrees when due. And as we talked about data being important, I know Leah, it was important for you to kind of add insight in that it only tells us part of the story. So, Ju so Leah, can you answer for us, how do we ensure the unique student voice and student experience is not overlooked in our efforts to examine data from an equity perspective? Yeah, well, well thank you all for, you know, having me here and being a part of this important conversation. Um, CCRI, we've had the thrill of getting to work with the Michigan Student Sex Success Center since 2018 on their coaching and mentoring efforts, and we look forward to continuing that work with them. Um, what I, what I want to add to um, what Julie was just saying is, yep, quantitative data is very important in finding both the problems and, and looking for solutions. But when we're talking equity work and trying to change our institutions to fit the needs and the circumstances and realities of students. Um, I'll go back to what John was talking about in, in Julie Wang's book, those friction points. To understand those friction points, we need to hear the student's voice. We need to hear the student's experience and we need to understand what their experience and needs are. So, um, so I'm arguing for the mixed, met mixed methods, let's keep that qualitative in there and let's make sure we have the qualitative and, and the student voice as part of both understanding what the problems are and the potential potential solutions. Um, because the faculty and the staff and the administration might see the data in one way and say, oh yeah, well, there's the problem, here's our solution. And for the students, their experience might be very different than what the faculty and the administrators are understanding if they're not asking them, if they're not having the conversations, the interviews, the focus groups and things like that. So I, I think getting the student voice into your equity work, getting it there as early and often as possible is quite important too. Um, not just asking them at the end if the solution makes sense to them, but asking them um, what they, again, what, the, what their stories are, what their experiences are is, is critically important. Um, but I also recognize gathering qualitative data is time intensive for those doing it and also for the students. And I also recognize your students, your community college students, time is really precious. And so how do you do that? Um, one of the COVID realities that gives me kind of hope is I heard from a lot of practitioners, you know, when this started and every, every institution had to suddenly go online, I heard a whole bunch of different ways institutions were engaging their students and trying multiple methods to, to ask them where they are, what they, what's going on, what, how can they help? They're, they're texting, they're calling, they're emailing, they're, they're doing town halls on Zoom. So um, that process of checking in and constantly asking students their experience and needs, I think it's a critically important qualitative part. Um, and, and, and we saw institutions figuring out how to do that and how to adapt to this new reality and help their students through that. Um, and I would just add with this idea of, you know, qualitative being time intensive and whatnot, um, another way we can keep the student voice as part of your equity work at your institutions is how many of your committees that are doing the equity work have students on them. Um, all of them, none of them. Is there one student? Is it that same student who's on all of the committees? Um, and if you're having focus groups, is it just your student government students who happen to be on campus all the time? Um, it, takes, it takes a lot of energy, but like I said, there's a part of me that's um, uh, seeing 
seeing institutions do a lot of reaching out and figuring out how to get that input to figure out how to adapt and, and deal with student needs uh, around equity. So I'll just leave that there. I think Leah makes some really good points, especially the ones that relate to what we figured out how to do fast during COVID. And I think how we've used and leveraged technology in a way to get really good qualitative data. I know we've done some texting with students, like one question, one word question, one, one question with students, and we've gotten some really rich data. So I think leveraging the technology and the expertise that we've all gained um, from using technology is a great way for us to really wrap our arms around qualitative inputs um, around this work that we need to do. And so we kind of talked about some definitions, but the hard part about the business that we're in is that it involves people um, and people delivering services and support to our students. So Julie, we talked a little bit about moving beyond gathering um, and interpreting quantitative and qualitative data, but understanding what the competencies that are needed for all members of our campus community. So we need to really understand the intersections of equity, mobility, and data so that we can all become true equity agents. So Julia, how do we develop and champion this type of cultural proficiency across the campus? Thanks, Kim. You know, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I like it because it starts from a premise that we need that data-based proficiency. Um, and that beyond that, you know, what would actually help our institutions become change agents? So, you know, in addition to um, quantitative and qualitative data proficiency, I really think that we need to infuse higher education with anti-racist proficiencies so that we are actually able to um, disentangle how policies um, and practice were created in a system that was never, let's be honest, designed at the outset to meet the needs of today's students. And so as institutions are evolving, as our student population is evolving, I think we need to um, look to a number of institutions like the institutions represented in today's call that have been serving disproportionately higher numbers of today's students and try to learn, um, like John was mentioning, uh, that the book focuses on an asset frame, I am a really, really ardent believer in the asset frame and understanding that there are institutions um, that I'm preaching in the choir here, but that have had to do more with less. And so out of that comes innovation um, out of necessity. And so I think that if we were to focus on an anti-racist proficiency across higher ed, we also need to combine that with the sort of asset-based appreciation for institutions that have already been serving today's students. Um, and then, you know, another proficiency that I think really gets undervalued in higher education um, is technology um, and a proficiency that appreciates what technology can do for us. So like you mentioned, Kim, I think Right now, during the pandemic, um, institutions, we did see a number of institutions scramble to try to figure out how to provide education um, remote and what does distance learning mean versus online education. You know, to me, it was surprising that it was such a scramble, knowing full well how many institutions are already providing online learning, distance learning to today's students, namely, you know, working parents or working students in general, individuals who have to juggle the multiple responsibilities of life and in many cases might be geographically dislocated, right? So um, not necessarily able to drive 90 miles to the nearest institution. And so online learning becomes an access question. And so if it already existed, my main question was when the pandemic occurred, why did higher ed know so little about it? And why was it the provenance of just a very select few? So I think once we start to appreciate what technology can do for us through the asset frame, instead of consistently focusing on the deficiencies, I think that's where we also start to open up potential opportunities 
um, one of which, you know, to talk about degrees one, two again, um, one of which the Michigan institutions in our first cohort and our second cohort that um, we are now onboarding our third cohort have all helped us learn, which is that a lot of the work of data analysis and data use is hard. It is a often manual burden that falls on, again, an under-resourced staff, often in the registrar's office. And so when we were um, going through the process with a number of institutions of how to mine data and help actually audit student records against programs of study, often institutions had to choose you know, one degree or the degree that was declared as intent because they just didn't have the person power to actually manually audit thousands of student records against, you know, hundreds, thousands of programs of study. And so we decided that this really needed to be automated. It is a place where technology could step in and actually turn data into that powerful tool. And so um, with all of your help, we are building a solution, an automated tool that will help institutions automate the degree audit process so that you can actually plug in all of your students' data against all of your programs of study and do some of that data work that Oakland was able to do to actually discover where the degrees were earned but never conferred and where are some of the paths to completion that um, some students are, again, just falling short on and could easily complete if they were able to re-engage and come back. Um, so, you know, I think those are some proficiencies that I think we need to pay more attention to, um, and I'll stop there. And Julie, I think you make a really good point. Not, not so much specific to transfer, but when we think about the challenges that we had in higher ed transitioning with COVID-19, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, I, I tease people that we talked a lot about uh, instructor proficiency around technology, you know, but, you know, there was a lot, we won't admit this, there was a lot of administrative deficiency around technology. And so one of the things I think that from an equity standpoint, to some degree, we have to ask ourselves is that if we were not prepared for that level of technology, were we really serving students the way they needed to be served? So I think, you know, it definitely is um, a reflection that we need to have as an industry um, in that, you know, was higher ed prepared? Um, and if we weren't prepared for technology at that level, how could we have been serving the people we claim we were serving? Um, and so I think it's something for a lot of us to think about as we think about issues of equity, because access is still a part of that. Um, and, and were we providing access, you know, to the people, especially as community colleges, um, that we claim we were or that we are, um, uh, are challenged to do, that we should be doing. Um, and so a, another big point that we kind of talked about, and I'm talking a little bit about instructors and administrators and, and staff in, in this next question, um, is we talked about cultural competencies across campus. And one of the things that we want to think about is that how are we viewing those competencies at every point um, of student contact across campus? And, and one of the stories that I shared um, with the panel last week was an advisor one time shared with me that um, often, she, often she'll go send a group of students to go get overrides. Um, and no matter how small or large the group of students are, usually the minority students come back without the override. Um, and so I think there are some, some hard conversations that we need to have um, in the classroom about what's happening there as well as what's happening um, in advising at financial aid desk. Um, and so I think there's just a lot of work that we need to do. Um, I, I love that Julie used the comment that anti-racist work that we need to be real honest about if we're gonna have more equitable outcomes. Um, so Ebony, um, I'll ask you as a faculty member um, and an equity leader in higher education, how do you think campuses can foster this type of culture um, of what and do you see as the responsibility of the campus community at large in accessing, understanding, and acting on data to improve these equitable outcomes? How can we broaden that, that conversation and those competencies? Right. You know, I think in many ways it is, um, you know, kind of going back to what uh, our colleagues have said, 
um, taking that asset approach. Um, in many cases, how are we uh, looking at students in ways that are very deficit laden? So, um, you know, to what extent do your programs within your district uh, represent our representative of uh, the demographics or the shifts in demographics within um, your district by race, by, by gender, by socioeconomic status, by age, you know, and, and so also being mindful um, in terms of uh, the climate, right, and the climate being both in and out of the classroom relative to curbing hostile hallways, chilly campus climates, um, you know, uh, we are at a, a period of, of time um, over the last uh, several years, actually, where there's been an uptick in uh, racial bias and racial hate crimes on campuses and community colleges aren't um, immune from that. Um, and we've, we're seeing that about roughly a 25% increase from year to year in reported hate crimes with the uh, category that has the highest um, number of reports being racial hate crimes. Um, and so we wanna you know, also be cognizant of uh, relative to um, you know, the anti-racist uh, proficiencies, the cultural competencies um, to, to really underscore that there are ways in which many faculty and staff have this kind of uh, perceived self-efficacy in terms of multicultural effic uh, efficaciousness that is, is really um, lacking. And so, um, you know, it would behoove us to also think about um, beyond the conversations um, you know, having that multi-tiered approach um, and in terms of that level setting, again, where we do the work with folks that is, uh, again, where we can scale up, thinking about interpersonally, individually, um, what that then translates like at a, pro a course level, a program level, a unit level, um, an institutional organizational level, which begets, you know, more of the structural inequities, which can help us to think about how we can then try to broach what is more systemic um, inequities. And so I think, you know, uh, having um, routine, um, you know, checks with regard to, you know, hey, does this curriculum or the informational materials associated with our curriculum or uh, our, our college, um, our events, again, to what extent are they representative, but just not in terms of surface level um, types of diversity, um, but really identifying the structures, the systems, the policies, um, you know, the strategies that are, are necessary um, to, again, do that root cause um, and refrain from, um, again, this per, uh, perceptions in terms of students uh, deficits or perceived student deficits, where then the onus um, is then put on the student and there's the blame shifting of, of uh, you know, us as educators and our institutions not um, fully being made accountable for how to um, improve the climate um, and one that can be, um, you know, uh, producing more equitable outcomes. And so it really, you know, begs for a, a way in which um, it's not been the same intentionality as what has been needed and what is called for, uh, but to, to marry what has been this completion agenda with a true equity agenda. I think one of the things that you, your closing comment there, the, the completion agenda, you know, really, you know, do we disaggregate those results? And I think that's something for us to really think about and what did that look like uh, with different types of outcomes, including transfer. But Ebony, I'm going to ask you another question um, again here. Um, the, the elephant in the room right now is COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. We all know has exposed systemic barriers to equity and mobility. And so how do you see this playing out at community colleges in particular? Right. You know, during this pandemic, um, it's really lifted the veil, right, on what we, we know to have been um, some systemic um, inequities, right? It's exacerbated them. Um, and particularly when we think about um, that, um, which is, you know, uh, you know affecting um, racialized, minoritized folks. Um, and so, you know, uh, thinking about some of what um, both Julie and John and Leah said earlier, our colleague, you know, Zulie Wang's work, where um, right now we think about community colleges and namely um, issues around mobility, how to accommodate student mobility, student swirl, um, you know, transfer equity, 
uh, and a shout out to to Dimple uh, Jan and, and uh, colleagues, um, Alfred Herrera and um, Santiago that, you know, when we think about uh, transfer, we, even before the pandemic, have really not had um, kind of a universal kind of transfer receptive culture um, or the onus being on both the sending and the receiving institutions for transfer receptivity. And so I think um, as we, you know, try to navigate COVID, um, students are, again, having to uh, find their way where um, maybe there's not that that on ramp for them. Um, you know, maybe we won't have the same type of, um, you know, um, mobility, if you will, right? And and it, it it begs the reason that if you have unmet basic needs, right? If you have issues that um, you know there's uh, access that is impeded in terms of uh, computer um, internet connections. Uh, if you are not set up, you know, properly for virtual learning, if your program of study is uh, career tech ed and, and potentially, again, where it is the type of program of study that doesn't readily lend itself to that quick pivot um, and going online and, and having a virtual learning experience, you know, our institutions just have to be much more proactive um, about the holistic um, approach um, to meeting student needs and development. Um, at this time. So, you know, some of the colleges we're working with, um, again, are, are trying to, um, you know, really beef up um, what's high touch um, and wrap around support services, you know, how we might revisit our, our policies to make sure that um, what we normally would have done relative to if you have an encumbrance and you're being able to register, that we have some more leniency um, with the timeline You know, one of the things that the timeline for which you have to have the uh, the bill paid, uh, then there's also the, the case where um, there's also the case where, you know, students are, are needing, um, again, with basic needs, um, how do we help them figure out how to get the SNAP benefits? How do we help them um, relative to um, financial aid um, and needing um, increased uh, living resources because of uh, unemployment now? You know, so it's any number of things, um, but that is really pivotal uh, point, a crossroads, if you will, that um, we have to be vigilant because the inaction of our, our institutions, um, you know, as much as we are all doing the best that we can, it really will um, amplify um, and heighten the numbers of folks, you know, as Julie was talking about before, we have scores of people with, um, you know, lots of college credit you know, that some, some college, but no degree. Um, and in an effort to not have that be a category that continues to rise, we, we have to be clued into um, these equity issues that are sadly, um, you know, um, just heightened and, and provoked um, more so by um, COVID-19. You know, and one of the things that Ebony com um, the commented about were the work that happens at our receiving institutions. And so I know, you know, we got over 144 people on this call. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about, and I think we all should be thinking about as community colleges, is that, you know, we a lot of times do hold, and we've experienced this at Washington Community College, we hold diversity that four-year institutions desire. Um, and we've also been, always been on the receiving end and kind of scraping together articulation agreements and what those agreements hold for us. And one of the things that we've started to talk a lot more about and we, we need to act more on is what are our expectations of how these receiving institutions receive our students and what happens when they get to those receiving institutions. You know, so those challenges that our students came to a two-year institution to avoid and to have small class sizes or whatever those needs may have been, they're just, you know, that two years later, those, those things still exist and now they're at a four-year institution and they may not have received our students in a way that we would have expected. So, you know, one of the things that we think about is really challenging what all we put into articulation agreements with our four-year partners and what are our expectations of them on how they're going to treat our students and how they're going to actually help them get to the finish line. So I think when we think about um, equity, I think that's a piece that as community colleges, we can think a lot more about. I know that's some work that we've been talking about um, at a statewide level, but it definitely is something to think about as we look at those transfer numbers. So I'm gonna go back to my questions. And, and again, 
Kim. Sorry, I, yes. I don't mean to interrupt you because we, we do have a scripted set of questions. However, I got, I'm getting some questions in the chat and one of them relates to what you just said. Uh, we didn't discuss this, okay. but all of you are professionals. So hopefully you don't mind that I'm gonna pop in with this question um, that came to me in the private chat. And it relates to what you're talking about with regard to articulation agreements and collaboration with our um, partner institutions. So because you all have a national perspective, this person is asking for your perception of the state of Michigan on students' ability to be mobile. So if you, know, if you weren't prepared for this question, that's okay. But if you have any thoughts off the top of your head as you think about Michigan, of course, being a decentralized state with less, uh, less um, policy-oriented solutions to this problem of mobility, particularly related to transfer, um, the person's question says, as we discussed, diversity, equity, and inclusion, student mobility versus transfer and positive outcomes for all students. They would like to know how you might rate the state of Michigan on students' ability to be mobile uh, using our current collaborative system. So that's a loaded question that you weren't prepared for and I'm uh, happy to let anybody speak up if you'd like or we can just pretend it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Okay. I was thinking and I'm gonna that, say that well, I'm not sure that any of our panelists were ready for this type of question with, with regards to their awareness of the way we work in Michigan. Um, probably John is most familiar, and of course, Julie, with your DWD work as well, um, and how these things work in our decentralized state. So I think that's a fantastic question. I appreciate that someone posed it. Um, I would love to have a conversation with you if you wanted to reach out to me or maybe Ebony has unmuted. Maybe you want to say something, yeah. Ebony. <laughs> uh, well, I, I did spend 13 years in Michigan before coming to Illinois. I was actually at Eastern Michigan for the first part, uh, early part of my career. Um, okay, you know, so, so with yeah. The, yeah, with the macro. Um, and in contrast to uh, other states, I think that... Um, you know, there are some commonalities uh, and there are some points of departure where um, Michigan actually, um, you know, is, is doing better. I know that there's the case where in some of the work we did, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, transition and transfer um, in Michigan, you know, there are lots of students that actually were not familiar with, you know, when you say macro, they it, it just, you know, deer and headlights. Um, they had no, uh, um, you know, uh, understanding or just didn't know the nomenclature in terms of the verbiage. And, and, um, and so I think that on one hand, there, there has to be uh, a more tightly coupled um, way in which, um, you know, that is communicated um, to students. Um, and, and also not just, you know, kind of two to four, but, you know, from two to two, four to two, four to four. Um, the other thing was that, mobility was really interesting to look at in the state of Michigan. Um, we have found where there were 16 different attendance patterns um, in the study that we were doing on um, transfer STEM students uh, and had not anticipated seeing that where on average um, students had attended at least three other institutions besides the, the institution they were currently enrolled in when completing our, our instrument, our survey. Um, and so, you know, and also, you know, I'm talking about credits and credit loss. Um, and so I really feel like, um, you know, at least my experience has been um, having been an educator in Michigan, being a community college researcher, um, but higher ed faculty in terms of, um, you know, um, the professional uh, programs and preparation of higher ed um, and student affairs uh, personnel, uh, that there's still a lot more work. Um, to be done around um, one, a, a value proposition um, for community college education, um, two, um, the extent to which, um, you know, uh, more broadly, uh, students and families um, understand um, the nuances of the different articulation initiatives, see that, again, to some degree, there, there is it's a very decentralized way of doing it. Um, but that um, when knowledgeable and when aren't with it and having, again, on both the sending and receiving side, um, the right support uh, in place, uh, that students' mobility isn't necessarily happened, but that students actually 
um, have, uh, you know, some sorely accommodated, if you will. But in many cases, um, students were racking up hours um, just in other states and students were dropping credits like breadcrumbs in terms of, of credit loss. So that's my two cents. Well, I appreciate that because I think it's very helpful, I think, for us to think about, you know, what we do with the lens of Michigan, which is very unique in its own ways. Um, and so I think there's still a lot of opportunity for us, you know, to collaborate. We've been doing some great work with MCCA in regards to working together around transfer, but Michigan in itself um, is a unique situation. Um, we had started talking a little bit about COVID-19, and so I'm going to switch over to Leah and, and ask her, what kind of innovations are you seeing in response to COVID-19 that may finally move the needle on structural change to improve equitable outcomes and mobility opportunities for historically underserved populations? And that kind of takes into the context that um, people are more clued in right now to the issues of equity um, in our society. And so, and so what kind of positive things do you see there? It's better if I unmute. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the, the biggest innovations that COVID has brought about is institutions realizing that big dramatic change can happen suddenly. And, it, and they had to, right? They had to adapt and they, they did. So the innovation is in the innovation. Um, them, all of them uniquely having to figure out their own um, what's, how's, and why's. And, and, and I think um, I heard practitioners say things like, who thought we could go all online in X number of weeks? You know, who thought? Because like, we've been trying to do that for years, or we've been trying to do this for blah, but suddenly we were able to make these big, massive, dramatic changes. And I, and I think that is, has a whole lot of potential to to help move equity work forward. But that's where, like our earlier conversation, where we're gonna need the data to understand what this means. Um, and, and other practitioners are saying, yeah, we made these big changes, but what's gonna stick when we can have, you know, in-person classes again? And I think that's the important questions to think about is, is having online events and allowing more student participation or, more participation from place-bound students, um, low-income students, things like that. So I, I think that's exciting and there's a potential if we keep checking in and looking who's being impacted and how is what changes should we keep? Because, and actually, Kim, you brought this up. Like, why did it take us to suddenly this happen for us to all go online and now serve our students this way? Is this now serving the students who need it the most? Is this is this having more online opportunities, helping students both with participation um, or not? Uh, so those are, those are, I think, important potential innovations and important data to be looking at, quantitative and qualitative, to see like what, what stays. Um, because we aren't like gonna, this, well, hopefully, I will say, well, hopefully things will be changing and we will all be back have the option to be back in classrooms. So what does that mean? Can we still provide enough hybrid tutoring? Are you, you know, tutoring had to go online, student support services had to go online. You had to figure out how to share, um, you know, food pantry food where the students aren't even on campus anymore. Are, are keeping some of those things gonna be useful for the equity agenda? Um, let, let's, let's uh, collect data and let's understand. So I think that one big innovation is, is even just recognizing how much change can happen suddenly when necessary. And I think some of those innovations have the potential for being useful for students um, in the long term. Uh, the other hopeful, um, what I'm hopeful innovation that's gonna happen is, is also another thing you brought up, um, Kim, is I'm hoping that this new reality, which is gonna be changes in enrollment that are gonna be happening at different institutions. Um, enrollment is going down, maybe in some places they're going up, but what I'm hoping is that the innovation of getting two-year and four-year colleges to work together to be real transfer partners. 
to be working together to have conversations about our students. I mean, they're not just our students while they're here at my institution and now they're your students, they're our students. And what do we do and how do we provide support? So the stuff you're talking about, talking to the, two, the four years where your students are going, what are they doing? What are they experiencing? But I, I feel higher ed is in a changing space. And I think that changing space hopefully is gonna push more transfer partnership work. And, and, and you guys will see us listing some of our, our work on high performing transfer partnerships. But one of the things we argue is if we exchange students, that doesn't make us partners. Um, partners in, in work require strategy and focus and attention and goals set on the student outcome. So I'm hoping that this COVID reality will drive innovation around institutions working together to make student um, beyond um, the technical exchange of credits. It's all, it's about culture. It's about connections. It's about soft handoffs as one of our advisors talked about soft handoffs means you actually literally walk your two-year student over to the four-year advisor or you make sure that you're on the email and things like that so i'm hoping for that innovation and then i would also argue the 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 positive lining that we've been talking about um, and it's been brought up in conversation um, during our time together so far is this idea that I think COVID is that COVID reality has been a part of our racial reckoning in this country. And so that desire or need to make equity explicit, I think is part of that right now is no longer, I, I don't believe students, staff and faculty at most institutions are willing to not talk about systemic racism and willing to not talk about the big picture um, realities of, of both outside the institution and within in the institution and equity, making that explicit instead of implicit. I think that's going to be a new normal or I hope for that. You make some really good points, Leah. One of the things that I think is so interesting is, and I commented this to someone, is that Zoom did exist before all of this happened, you know, but it never was a solution to providing, you know, our students who worked all day access to tutoring or office hours with the instructor. You know, we continue to require them to drive to campus, you know, for all those support systems. And, and again, I think none of us are stating that, you know, is it instruction? Is it support systems? Is it, you know, this wonderful... Um, summit we're having, none of us are jumping to what we need to keep, but we do need to think about what made more sense um, in this way and how it served people. And again, that whole word of access, how it provided access to people in a way um, that we just weren't providing before. There's a lot of services we didn't provide to night students or early morning students um, that we really need to be thinking about. And, and like you said, continue to check in about what's working and what's not. Um, I, we have a lot of opportunities. So I, I love that we're talking about the hopefulness of it because there was a lot of things that were spotlighted by COVID-19, but all of us learned a lot really, really fast. Um, so John and Leah, back to Leah again, how do we empower educators to be more actionable with equity data, particularly related to students in transition? And to this end, what new tools and resources are you seeing in the field related to equity data and mobility? Um, in particular, I think we're talking about how can transition partners work together to follow students through mobility pipelines, which is what we kind of started talking about a little bit there, Leah. So John and Leah, how would you answer that question? Uh, yes, great. This is a great question. I'm, I want to answer it. I do want to jump in on the Michigan question, though, because it's uh, it sort of it sort of piqued my interest for one, because I'd sort of, uh, you can't really answer that question. You know, they, like it's too, like Michigan community colleges, there's, it's just so much going on. Um, it's hard to sort of have a, have a, um, a good answer, but 
um, you know, what one thing I've been working on just over the past few months is sort of all these like state level um, reports of like iPads, like from enrollments to financing, how colleges are finance. And um, of course, there's all the transfer metrics that we work on and dual enrollment metrics. And, you know, we always look at states because I think people are interested in states. But the thing is, like, there's so much variation within states. And even if in, within an institution, there's so much variation. Um, and so, and it's really in the variation that you can find what's working. And and then try to scale that up and including like, you know, so disaggregating, um, looking at variation across student groups, but also like your transfer partners or the, the at least uh, partners. Uh, yeah, I think it may be an overstatement mm -hmm. in terms of where you're sending uh, students to. Um, and there's a lot of variation there in terms of outcomes, as well as the high school that you're serving through dual through dual enrollment. And um, the few observations I want to make, I just was feverishly poking around on our website and these like tools where you can look up colleges and states is that I think just in general, looking at enrollments outcomes, Michigan seems pretty similar to the national average um, or sort of like middling um, among other states. Although, uh, so for transfer outcomes specifically, because the National Student Clearinghouse now is reporting every year on these transfer, you know, how many community college students get a bachelor's degree in six years. Michigan is one of 16 states nationally that has made positive progress on that metric um, from the, you know, the most recent five years. Um, so there is some, some improvement happening. Um, that's sort of dated. It's all very sort of historical at this point. Um, in terms of enrollments, Michigan looks very similar in terms of what we see post, you know, the Great Recession in 2008, which is, you know, declining enrollments at community colleges, especially among 25 and older students and Black students specifically. Um, the growing trend um, since the Great Recession is uh, high school students, dual enrollment. Um, and I think that this is a really important point because um, the right now, or like in 2015, for instance, um, in iPads, we see about 20,000 dual enrollment students, which we're sort of using if they're 17 and younger as a proxy. It's not perfect, but that's what we're using. And still, that's only about 5% of the high school population in the state. So there's a lot of like opportunity for growth there. And uh, white students are about two times more likely than black students to participate in dual enrollment. So there's inequity in access. We see that in other states as well. Um, but I think there's a real opportunity, especially in the context of the declining black enrollment in the state and nationally. And uh, just today, I don't know if folks saw an inside higher ed, the clearinghouse came out with, you know, an early estimate. I don't even know if it includes Michigan of community college enrollments this fall, showing um, one of the biggest groups of that that's down in terms of enrollment this fall is black students in community colleges down 12% compared to last fall. Um, the only group in community colleges that has gone up according to this early estimate is dual enrollment students. So the, it's like, we got to put that together. Like, let's get more, let's get more black and brown students in dual enrollment. Um, and I think that's a, that's just a big takeaway, um, a big opportunity. Um, and it does connect to the answer to this question because one of the tools um, that we've been using to start the conversation is just looking at, you know, why, you know, students are moving and shaking all over. Um, students are more workers and wor more workers are uh, having, you know, ed educational opportunities provided not through colleges, by the way, but their companies um, that are in increased online providers. So um, there's a lot of mobility happening in and out of the workforce and that line is being blurred. But um, I think what we see a, a helpful tool coming back to colleges is just centering on the students. Why are they there? What are their aspirations? What's their experience? Um, what are they seeking? What are their goals? Um, and how's that aligned to like what program they're in or what plan they're on or what courses they're taking? Um, and um, really kind of this back to basic questions around who's enrolled at our college and what program are they in and what does that lead to? And is that something that's gonna like add value to their lives or provide further opportunity? Um, and um, so we have this tool, uh, I think it, there's a link in the PowerPoint slide. Um, it basically presents uh, you know, a way to think about different community college programs in terms of like access to opportunity um, more of this research has done done in the four years, like thinking about who's got access to STEM bachelor's degrees and increasing representation in those like those bachelor's degrees that lead to highly remunerative fields. But in community colleges, it's, uh, it's even more important because community colleges degree offerings are stratified not only by subject STEM or 
you know, transfer, um, uh, you know, other sort of fields, nursing, if you think of others, but also by length. So short term, long term credentials transfer to a bachelor's degree. Um, so I think that raising this question about, you know, what program are students in, is that aligned to their goals, and where do we see issues in terms of uh, uh, inequitable representation across those programs um, is really an important one. Um, you know, we have an Excel template, colleges can upload like a student uh, level file and it just populates some charts that sort of um, uh, present some of these issues like um, one of some of the big aha moments is just, you know, you do this and you see like a huge chunk of your students are just in these general programs like general studies, general transfer, dual enrollment, um, non degree. Uh, it starts to ask the question, you know, what, who are those students? What are they seeking? How are we, you know, adding value, um, you know, the sort of value proposition of the college. Um, another part of that is just, you know, looking at each of the top programs, what's the composition, what's the racial breakdown of our top programs? And, you know, where do we see patterns of inequitable representation? And, you know, you see common trends emerge like the, the nursing programs, the impacted programs and um, sort of uh, the proportionality there starts the conversation, which is a difficult one um, in here, but that's the sort of starting line in terms of really thinking to, we are open access institutions, but is there equal access in our programs in terms of leading to further opportunity? And, and I'm gonna quickly add, not really a tool, but a thought. Um, when we when we talk to students who are transferring between partnerships, um, the institutions will often wanted to share data. That's part of the question is, is, but they technically for a lot of different reasons or for the state or they have different, they're using the two year and the four year are using different systems so they can't talk. Um, so we never really found two institutions that really have this nailed on how to share data to understand how our students are doing at their own institutional level. Um, what they really did was kind of built relationships. Um, the best we saw for uh, was at kind of the programmatic level where we saw deans and faculty kind of meeting with each other um, at least, you know, a few times a year to talk about the students the curriculum, the student experience, the courses and things like that. Um, so I would say the relationship building and, and creating those relationships between the two and four year partners is what we saw as really impactful because in some instances, like in one story, the, you know, there's changes of, of coursework, um, changes in the curriculum, all that help the students, you know, pathway and progress. Um, so uh, that's, that's more of a, the, the non-technical tool of relationship building between the institutions and conversations to make the pathway um, easier for the students. And, and I think um, Erica just made a comment in the chat about the Michigan transfer tool that um, the, the state that we've developed together um, that I think has served as a, as a great tool. I know um, our school has found a lot of different ways to use it. I know most schools across the state have, um, but I know under COVID-19, as we saw more guest students come in to the uh, community college, it was a really great tool to help those students um, help their mobility um, as they were taking advantage of their local community college. So um, I think that's a, a totally, um, a really, really good tool and, and big improvement from some of the tools that we've had um, in the past. We're gonna open it up for some more questions. I'm gonna kick it over to Katie, but I will say one closing thing that's totally, you know, um, kind of summarizes some of the conversations we're having, the possibilities of COVID-19 that we can leverage, as well as some of the challenges. Um, this morning, I had the pleasure of listening to Scott Galloway, who I think a lot of you guys may have probably read or have listened to some of his TED Talks. He's been very provocative about higher education um, over um, the last uh, several months. Um, and one of the things that John mentioned was these new providers of education. And I think that, you know, it's something that we all need to be keeping at on the top of our mind and conversations is that um, the disruption may not be over. Um, and while we're having conversations about equity and transfer and all the things that we know we need to do and we need to stay focused on, um, there's more disruptors coming 
um, and, and, and this um, is going to definitely be an opportunity for a lot of other type of organizations that may not be higher ed institutions um, for us to also keep in top of mind as we think of strategies around these areas. Um, you know, somebody might have a better hook um, around um, serving the populations that we know we should be the ones serving. So I think that's something very important for us to continue to think about. I am going to ask Katie to chime in with some questions um, that came from the chat that our panel um, can answer, but this was really fun and I really enjoyed I'm moderating this panel. Um, I feel like I'm with some, you know, like really, a really, really cool, smart people with some great insight. And it's definitely been a pleasure. Um, and you guys have a, a great, great evening. I'm going to sit back and be quiet and let Katie take over with some more questions. Thank you. And again, panelists, I apologize because I, I expected that we would talk a little longer, that y'all might talk a little longer. Um, it looks like maybe Leah wants to say something before I do open it up for questions. Oh, she's clapping. She's saying yay, because Kimberly did a fantastic job. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, you were a fantastic moderator, Kim. I appreciate your assistance, um, especially with all the, the kind of difficult last names that we had on the panel today. I said, well, that's why I had you do the intros, because you're just better at that kind of thing than me. <laughs> Um, but I am going to go ahead and um, point out a couple of things. All of our panelists have provided some excellent resources. And so I wanted to make sure that you're all aware that these things are within the slide deck and they're all clickable. So you can go ahead and look. We've got some goodies from each one of the um, organizations represented on the panel today. And then I also want to point out before I get to the questions, um, which again, I told the panelists we weren't going to do because I didn't think we'd have time for it, but there's at least one that came in through a, a private chat. So if somebody has a, a thought on it, I thought I would pose it to you all and others can certainly go ahead and do that. But our intentions were that you might reach out to the panelists on Twitter and ask your questions that way. Um, however, before we get to that, I wanted to point out that we have one final session tomorrow for the Student Success Summit. It's at the very top of this big list of upcoming events. And it's actually a great um, tag on to this session because we have a panel of frontline faculty and staff who are really those on the ground folks focused on making change related to everything that was discussed today. All of them have an equity mindset and we're looking forward to hearing from um, that panel and from our evaluator of the Michigan Guided Pathways Project. So hopefully if you're not registered yet, you will do so. And then you can see I bolded a number of events that deal with equity that we are gonna be focused on this fall um, and beyond. We aren't just interested in equity in the fall, but um, I hope that you'll join us. And I hope um, certainly all of our panelists are welcome to join us for our tweet chats on this topic that are coming up in October and November as well. With that being said, I am also supposed to let you know that you can contact us with any questions and ask you please to fill out a session evaluation before you leave for the afternoon. And then as I shared earlier, we would love to hear from you on Twitter and our panelists are expecting that. We did discuss that in our, um, in our preview conversation. If you have the opportunity to um, think of questions or, or want to tweet any follow-ups from today's conversation, you can tweet them as, as professionals or their professional organizations as well. One of the questions that came into the chat that I think is critical and it relates to mobility, it relates to uh, credit exchange, student um, movement, is related to DevEd and the impact of developmental education, which now I'm trying to scroll and find the question. Here it is from Kathy. Uh, the question is, what role do you think developmental education plays in preventing historically marginalized students from succeeding? And certainly you can see how when you think about DevEd and, and mobility, there's a relationship. But I wonder if any of our panelists have any thoughts on that. Um, I, I can jump in. Uh, my, my my colleagues at at CCRC have you know been studying DevEd for many years. It's um, it hasn't been the area of, of my focus as I, as I've worked there, but I'm familiar with sort of their kind of main findings. Um, you know, and and just around DevEd, the sort of body of evidence uh, of the importance of sort of reforming the traditional uh, placement driven many many levels or pre of prerequisite um, DevEd. Um, and, you know, there, there just seems to be quite the evidence base around just the benefit of especially students, particularly students on the margin, um, bumping up to college level with additional supports and sort of the whole movement around co-requisite reforms and other sort of uh, strategies there. Um, you know, this has disproportionate, DevEd 
has disproportionate negative effect on students of color and those from marginalized groups. And, um, you know, there, one, one study um, that's sort of forthcoming is, you know, there have been randomized control trials, but here we're looking at a whole state and doing, um, you know, uh, at scale evaluation of the implementation of co-requisite remediation in, in Tennessee. Um, sort of the interesting takeaways there is that, um, you know, looking at the findings, it, it, it appears that, you know, dev, er, co the co-rec model appears to help students, but the bigger finding is just that the pre-rec or historical model is really just hurting students. Um, and um, in, in Tennessee, there was the same time the implementation of the math pathways, so aligned math courses to degrees like um, where there was a huge shift from predominantly taking algebraic math to statistics and, uh, and quantitative reasoning. That um, really drove a lot of the effects of the co-requisite implementation. So there's still a lot to learn in terms of how do we implement CoRec, how do we do it well, what do we do with students that are, are sort of placing into, um, you know, historically the, low, the lowest levels of remediation, but um, I just think there's a huge equity imperative and sort of an ethical question around offering that um, traditional model. Thanks, John. So that's it. I actually thought there was another question that came in, but it wasn't. It wasn't a question for you all. Um, but I do want to ask our panelists, is there anything else you wanted to share that we didn't ask you about or something that you wanted to jump in on from a previous line of questions um, as kind of a last word on the topic before we say goodbye for the afternoon? Uh, Katie, I'll jump in here. There, there's one issue that we, we haven't discussed yet um, that does impact mobility and you know, it's how higher ed can better serve students who have been involved in the justice system. And, you know, the, the Second Chance Pell pilot program, which the first round of which began under the last administration, um, President Obama announced the beginning of it in 2015, actually announced that three of the selected institutions um, through this experimental waiver that would be allowed to enroll students through Pell Grant funds were actually located in Michigan. It was Delta, Jackson, and Mott. And, you know, I think that the idea of we have to connect the dots when we know that so many students in this country have accumulated credits without a degree. And we also know that higher education in prison has ebbs and flows through the years. Um, and as we debate at the federal level whether we should um, be bringing back Pell Grant eligibility for incarcerated students, we are already seeing higher ed and prison expanding through this pilot program. And so we need to make sure that institutions are understanding the mobility involved in students who may begin their higher education journey while incarcerated. But given the fact that, you know, we know 95% of individuals who are currently incarcerated will at some point be released, we really need to make sure that higher ed is ready to receive students. And there are institutional policies that impact how well higher ed can support students. Um, you know, and across the landscape of even just within Michigan, institutions have different policies. You have institutions like Wayne State University who have never asked about criminal records in admissions. Um, but then on the other end of the spectrum, you have institutions like University of Michigan that is now considering removing that box, which I think is a really great step in the right direction. Um, but because institutions have their own policies, we need to make sure that the mobility of those students isn't, you know, left to fall through the cracks as well. That's a really good point. And I gotta be honest with you, it's not something that I thought about before I started looking into the resources that you guys sent us from IHAP today. Um, but when you think about issues of equity and social mobility writ large and the very serious issues with our criminal justice system related to racial equity in particular, um, they are not unrelated topics. So I appreciate that you brought that up, Julie. Anything else that our panelists would like to share uh, before we close down? I do see another question that has come in. So I'll um, have Erica pose that question because it, it's a question that she has, I believe. One 
one more thing I'll add on the dual, I'm looking at dual enrollment. And just if you are not look, disaggregating who's in dual enrollment at your college, please do and disaggregate it by race and all the other information you have, because the dual enrollment is such an opportunity for high school students, especially now. And it, you know, access is the challenge here. Uh, you know, these, these programs really benefit students. And there's a really robust set of early college and middle colleges in Michigan. So there's a lot to, to build on um, there. And the other thing I would suggest is, so disaggregating by student characteristics, um, but also by the high schools that you're serving and which high schools aren't you serving? Because we, we see in access to dual enrollment, there's both this sort of within school inequity of white students are more likely than black students within a high school, but also between school inequity, lower resource, higher minority high schools, less uh, likely to partner with their local colleges. And that is such an opportunity for serving your community is to look at the schools in your service area uh, and be strategic about which school partnerships you wanna invest in. Thank you. I'll ask Erica to get on deck because she's going to ask a question, I think, of Dr. Hearns. But before so, uh, before she does so, I want to pay attention to something that came into the chat. That's not a question per se, but it's something important for all of us to be thinking about because of the new uh, Futures for Frontliner program that came through in Michigan um, that is being championed by Governor Whitmer. And this person's note is right on, being prepared for the essential workers in Michigan that are going to be applying for that scholarship and the unique needs that will come um, with that body of students, which are not unlike the unique needs of the students we already serve at Michigan Community Colleges, but certainly an important idea, especially for those who may be first generation or have may not, may not have been in higher education for some time. So thank you for that comment, I appreciate it. Erica, would you like to pose your question? Sure, and I'm glad you mentioned Futures for Frontliners, Katie. Um, we've, we've talked about it a few times over the last couple weeks, and we continue to update our the numbers we're hearing, but we are already hearing that over 50,000 people have applied for the Futures for Frontliners program. And some of you may have heard during our uh, policy session yesterday that um, actually the same day we had our policy session, I couldn't have planned it better. Um, we, got date, we got information about uh, the budget for the next fiscal year in Michigan, which starts on October 1st. And we were pleased to see that the Michigan Reconnect program was funded, which will provide a tuition-free pathway to an associate degree for adult learners um, over the age of 25. Um, so it's a, it's a terrific, two terrific programs that uh, have the potential to have a huge impact on our colleges. So look for more information about that um, over the next several months. But like Katie said, I actually have one final question for um, our moderator. And I was looking through the participant list and Kimberly, I noticed a lot of your um, peers peer chief academic officers are on this call as well. And, you know, I, you have had tough jobs over the last several months. Uh, you have tough jobs, I think, generally, but really tough jobs over the last several months. So to close out, I wanted to ask, um, what do you need from all of us? Um, if, if we could help with something, what, what would you like, where would you like our help? Not just at the center, but um, thinking about all the folks on this call. You know what, I think one of the things that I th thought was just so amazing on campus and statewide is how much everybody helped one another. I mean, I don't think any of us answer emails so fast when someone needed something, you know, any of my colleagues, what they were doing at different schools. Um, and then I think that MCCA really, you know, stood in the gaps when it came to large conversations with faculty and switching, um, you know, to online having those roundtable discussions, I think those things were extremely helpful. Um, I think that the more that we can operate and learn from one another as a state, I think that we're going to probably come out of this overall and individually much better. So I think that's really made a big difference. I think the collegiality that has happened across the state, and, and I'd have to say even across the country, I mean, there's tons of Twitter and Facebook groups that I belong to that have been so helpful with coming up with solutions sharing resources. So I think that, you know, we just have to know that I think this is a big opportunity for community colleges. It's going to be a big challenge for higher ed overall. 
And I think if we don't view it together, it's going to be a, it, we're going to all struggle a lot. And so I think, you know, the institutions that were on, on the panel today, I think the research that they're doing, I think all of those things have played in us being where we're at right now. But I think really understanding um, the, the disruptors that are coming, I think it's going to take all of us to understand that and work together. And so I think, I, you know, I'm amazed every day at how great everybody's been. I, you know, the faculty, I mean, staff, I mean, it's amazing that we pulled this off. Um, you know, no one's went out of business in the last six to seven months. And that really is a miracle by itself. And we're still serving students. Um, but I think that we got to kind of hunker down and make sure the collegiality is kept so that we can all move forward together. Um, because, you know, I think all of us do this work because we know and we believe that higher education is an engine of mobility in general for students, it, you know, it has been for me and I'm sure most people on this call. And if we believe that we got to sustain it. And so I think, you know, working together is going to be the thing that we got to continue to do and being responsive to one another, which we've done in amazing, amazing ways. Um, that's definitely on my keep list. Um, and so I think we got to keep doing what we've done for the last six to seven months as it relates to that part of it. Um, so that we can all see a different future. I'm, I'm practicing not saying when we get out of this, because there, I don't think there's a getting out of this. I think this is what it is. Um, and so we can create a better future. I think that collegiality, I think, is going to be the most important thing that we can do. So, I, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been the coolest thing to see and experience. Um, and I look forward to us continuing to do that part of it. What a wonderful way to close the session. Um, and certainly relevant to my gratitude to all of our presenters who literally some of them received messages from me on Twitter that said, hey, you want to be in a session with us to talk about equity and mobility? And they all unequivocally said yes. So thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to Dr. Hearns and my colleagues at MCSS and all of you that showed up for this critical discussion. We are just getting started talking about equity. Um, we will keep this conversation front and center as our work continues and we look forward to having productive, potentially difficult, and hopefully inspiring conversations on the topic in the future. Thank you all, have a great afternoon. We'll see you soon. <laughs>